welcome to the bridge. We're so glad you're here. I feel like we got the main meal and I just get to give dessert. So that's good, right? We're so glad you're here, and I have the, the honor to give the word today, which I'm so blessed and thankful to my husband, Pastor Brian. You know, um, in my new role with our denomination, um, I'm, the, I'm the Western District's Women's Mobilizer, and my goal is to identify women that want to become senior leaders, senior pastors. They want to plant churches. Our denomination is um, very much supportive of women in leadership, and I have to tell you, there are still churches, four squared churches around this nation that don't make room for women behind the pulpit, and that's so foreign to us because Pastor Brian has always been very inclusive of that, and we're really, really blessed because it's going to take man, woman, child to get the word of God out to the world, not just men. We're, we're multiplying it for us to, to be able to do what God's called us to do in kingdom business. Amen? So I'm blessed for that. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for always opening up your pulpit to us, me and Pastor Teresa, and anyone else that God starts to stir and put that dream inside of you. Hmm. So we are continuing our um, sermon series on prayer today. Pastor B started us off a couple of weeks ago. He reminded us to pray in faith, to pray the word um, over our life, and to pray in the spirit on all occasions. Um, it was a great word. And then Pastor Teresa last week talked about just the power of praying with others, where two or more are gathered in our midst. Jesus shows up. It was an awesome word. And um, today, I'm going to be talking about um, our personal prayer life and knowing the presence of God. And if there was one thing that I could share in my lifetime with this church, I was thinking about it this week, and I had this urgency in my spirit that I was to talk about this with you. And I was asking the Lord, like, if something, God forbid, was to happen to me tomorrow— that what was the one thing I'd want to bring to my church family, this would be it. It would be on prayer because it's a topic that I love so much. So, so let's pray and we'll dig in. So Lord, thank you so much for your presence in this place. Thank you that as I start to share about your presence, Lord, that you're already here. I pray, Father, that Holy Spirit, you come and you speak through me and that you land on hearts the way only you can do. And that you remove me from the situation. And Holy Spirit, just speak to your people today what they need to hear for their life, Lord. What you want to speak right where they're at. So I pray, Lord, that you use me today for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is a topic that I love. My prayer life has sustained me in my life. I'll probably get emotional. That's one bad thing about having women, I guess, in the pulpit. But... <laughs> I'll be emotional because it's such a dear topic to my life, and uh, so much has happened in this space. So um, the Lord has taught me his voice. He has taught me who he is, his character, his call in my life, everywhere in a space that I meet with him. My question for you today in our series called um, Retreat to Advance which I loved, actually. We were at staff meeting, and Pastor Brian said that, that title, Retreat to Advance, and I wrote it down. And I, I felt it was so powerful because I do believe in order to um, advance in anywhere in our life, move forward, we have to retreat and have a strong prayer life with God. So my, my question to you this morning is where do you retreat to? What does your space look like? Do you have a space in your home? Do you have it? Is it in your car on the way to work? Like, where do you go and pray? Is it a nature walk where you pray in the spirit the whole time and God speaks to you? Well, I'm, I'm giving you a little peek into my life. This is very similar, except for I usually have a big table that's a lot messier in my room. That every morning I get up, I do a couple chores while the coffee's brewing, and I grab my coffee. I get up a little earlier 
Um, then my husband, I think it's just habit from when the kids were little. I like to have my quiet time where the house is quiet and no one's awake. That's just the way I'm wired. And I go up to my room and I sit in my quiet space. This space is where God has met me over the years, um, every day of my life. And I'm, it's my hidden place. It's my sacred space, my safe, my safe place. I believe, um, family, that we're living in a day and age where we need to know God's voice. We need to go deeper with him. He gives us the privilege and the opportunity to go deeper with him. And I believe that happens in your prayer life when you're connected with him. There's going to be people that come up to us, maybe even people here at church that say, I believe God's saying this for you. How are you going to know if that's right for you or not? It happens when we know his voice. When people speak to you, you're going to be able to say, eh, it's not for me. Or you're going to be able to say, yes, amen. I do believe that's for me. We're going to know his character and we're going to know if it lines up or not by this space that we have with him every day. We're going to know through discernment and the intimate relationship through prayer. We will know what's real and we will know if it's him or not. It's in this space that he speaks to us. I always have a hard time with the papers. This is why we need a bigger pulpit <laughs> for all my stuff. <laughs> we need a little water cup holder, right? Just saying. See, I'm always thinking and envisioning. See? So in Exodus 33 on Mount Sinai, Moses had an interaction with God. And as he interacted with God, he went up there and God was depositing in him the Ten Commandments. God was showing him his ways, how he was providing for his people by his design as their creator, what he was giving them, included things like Sabbath and rest and sanctity of life and also the covenant of marriage and all the things that the Ten Commandments came that gave him. And as he came down off the mountain, it says, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking to God. I thought it was so interesting. As Moses came down from the mountain, he was glowing. He was physically glowing. The people were scared of him when he came down from being in the presence of God. I believe that there's still believers that carry that glow today. They carry the glow of peace, the glow of miraculous faith, the, goal, the, the glow of boldness, as well as the authority that they carry. You might think it's confidence, but it's the God confidence, the authority that he's given them, and it all happened in spending time with God and in his presence. I've met people like this. Um, we have an aunt and an uncle, Uncle David and Aunt Christine, and Aunt Christine exudes God's love. She exudes God's presence. I met her when I was 18 years old when I got married, and she was just such a role model for me. She had four kids. She raised them in such a godly way, and I'd never seen a marriage quite like that. They were so um, caring and loving, and just they brought the presence of God wherever they went. We recently ran into them, and... Um, we were at the hospital visiting Brian's dad about six weeks ago, and I went to hug her, and I hugged her, and I just started like, feeling like I was going to cry. And I'm thinking, I'm a grown woman. I've got five grown kids, and it brought me back to right when I was 18 years old when I hugged her. She has this presence that makes you feel safe and loved and just like you want to pour out your heart to her. And it's the presence of God that she carries. And I want that. Don't you? I want to go in a room, and I want to have the glow. And right when I'm in the room, everything changes because I'm there. That's what I want. Don't you? My prayer is that you will have such a hunger in your heart and a longing in your soul to be intimate with Jesus. That nothing else in your walk with God, I won't say matters, it all matters, but the most important thing is your intimate relationship with Jesus. Oh, I'm out of practice. Right. 
Henry Nouwen, in um, his book that I just love, In the Name of Jesus, it's a great little book if you've never read it. He was um, an amazing man, and he wrote this quote that I just love. It's a, little, it's a little harsh, to be honest. I guess that's why I like it. I like people to tell me how it is, you know? It says, without solitude, it is almost impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to be with God and listen to him. Wow. You see, in the Gospel of Luke, the disciples had a front row, front row seat to Jesus in his life. They spent three and a half years with him. He was their teacher. They walked with him. They watched him. We talked about that in class today. They watched him in what he did. You know, they, watched, they were good um, observers. That's how they learned. They took it in. They didn't necessarily get involved with what he was doing. They watched and just were standing there and seeing everything he was doing, right? And in regard to the relationship with, their fa with his father and the way he ministered to people, they had very few direct questions for Jesus. They only asked him one thing. I was thinking about that this week, one thing. They didn't ask, how do you win a theological debate? How to Sabbath properly? How to live a healthy, balanced life? Or how to bring people to Christ? The right way to pray for healing or cast out a demon or perform miracles? In Luke 1, 11, 1, we see them ask Jesus to teach them one thing. Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus communed with the Father in the very presence of the disciples. They watched him. They knew him. They witnessed him. They saw that Jesus' prayer life was his inhale and his exhale. It was everything. It was all he needed on this earth to accomplish kingdom business that his father had for him. The same Jesus that, like I said, cast out demons, who healed lepers, who opened blind eyes. They watched Jesus raise the dead. They, they heard the greatest sermon ever told in Matthew 5. And all of those things, they asked him one thing. Lord, teach us to pray. You see, what the disciples wanted at the end of the day was Jesus' prayer life. That's what they wanted. They connected the dots and discovered that Jesus' public life of ministry was the direct result of his private life of prayer. If you want to do anything for Jesus in your life, if you have these dreams and aspirations that I know he's birthing in you, big dreams, big ideas, it's going to all be... All the blueprints are going to come in this space with him. We need to understand that an ongoing, intimate relationship with Jesus is built here. It's what sustained him too. It's what should sustain us. Shouldn't we follow his example? Prayer is where we hear his voice. It's where we begin to look like him and act like him. And, and we hear his voice. We, can, we begin to speak like him. You know when you're married a really long time? And you go to a restaurant, and Brian maybe gets up and goes out to use the restroom or something, and the waitress comes, I know to get him a Diet Coke. I know what kind of food he's going to like. I know what he's going to want on the side. I can order for him. I start to know his... <laughs> Let's see, mouthing off. <laughs> I know what he's going to order. I know what he's going to have on the side of, of his meal, right? His condiments. I know all those things. He knows that about me. He knows about me a lot better than he, I know about him. That's what he's saying. He's a good observer. When we sp spend time with Jesus, that's what happens. We're so connected. We start to know what he likes, what he doesn't like, what we should say and what, we, what he wants us to say. He starts to speak to us. So there's a quote from Sam Lopez, and it's, he, he wrote The Creative Power of Prayer. He says, Prayer ensures that our efforts yield the kind of eternal fruit that every follower of Jesus should yearn to produce, kingdom fruit. What kind of fruit do you want to produce in your life? I was thinking about that today, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I probably missed one in there. There's nine of them. Um, so... The fruits of the Spirit. And I, when I sit down, I, I started to think about that. What kind of fruit am I producing in my life? What kind of fruit do I need to produce in my life? And I asked God, you know, what kind of kingdom fruit should I be doing right now? I mean, in general, right, we're supposed to have them all. 
But right now in my life, in this season, what am I supposed to produce? And this is where he tells me. This is where he speaks those things to me. We meet with Jesus, and he speaks those things. So you might say, okay, Pastor Cynthia, I'll carve out a little space in my house, but where do I start? Where do I begin? So I just want to help you with some tips. And a lot of you saints have been saved a long time, and you may know some of this, but they're good reminders. They're good reminders to revisit some things that maybe we've lost. You know, our time with Jesus can, um, I'm creative, so mine never looks the same. But this is kind of, I was thinking about it, I know a lot of people wouldn't have their phone with their time with the Lord. I've always had my, t- my phone. I do um, the Bible app, what's it called, version. I do the verse of the day. That's how I start off because I'm half asleep and I'm drinking my coffee and I just kind of like to listen to someone. And so I start off with that. But as I spend time with the Lord and in his word, he brings you to my mind, people in my life. And I'm to to let them know I'm praying for them this morning. When I text you and tell you I'm praying for you this morning, I'm really praying for you. (laughs) So he'll put you on my heart or a verse on my heart or I'm supposed to speak a word of encouragement over someone. And this is where he prompts me to do that. So I keep my phone with me so that I do it right there in that minute. Because if I second guess myself, was that really the Holy Spirit? Like the enemy always puts that doubt in our mind. I won't do it. So I've learned in uh, my prophetic gifting that God's given me, I act right away. Because we all have our humanness and our flesh that will doubt if that's correct. Is that really the Holy Spirit telling you to do that? If, If I go into Starbucks and the Lord says, you need to go up to that person and tell them, like I, I did it this morning, the Lord I, gave me a picture over someone, and I don't necessarily, I know it's God because I know how he speaks to me now, but like I said, it could be for later, so I have to be careful how I speak that over someone, but now I just come out and I share it. Does this, does this resonate with your heart? I tell them, you know, does this sound like something the Lord would speak to you? Because it's okay if they tell me no, because then it's okay, Lord, Redirect me. Where, where did I miss it? You have to mess up. You have to fail to move forward in the gifts that God's given you, but you have to at least try. My mom used to tell me, you know, if you don't step out and speak things over people, he's going to use somebody else. And I didn't want that. I don't want him to use me. So I just want to encourage you with that. So there are a few tips here for your prayer life. The first one is to start off your prayer life with praise and honor. You know, when they asked Jesus, um, Lord, teach me to pray, he taught us, he taught the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So that's how we begin our prayer time with him. This holy is your name. You honor, you give thanksgiving in your heart. You thank him for what he's given you. And not just thank him for what he's given you, but thank him for who he is. You could just speak those things. Thank you for being my creator. Thank you for being, you know, generous and all the characteristics of God. Your mercy, your love, you saved me. I think of who I was before I knew you and who I could have been. God help us, right? And that you just sit there and you just bask in that. You have to start with prayer and thanksgiving. And I believe that sets your heart right to be able for him to speak and receive. And the second thing is confession, Confession. Now, after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they ate, and they ran off in disobedience, and they hid. And in Genesis 3, 8 through 10, we read, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And verse 9 says, But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? I was thinking about this. It's not like he was saying, Where are you? Can't find you. He's God. He knew, he knew where they were. He was saying, where are you? Come out. Come be with me. It's okay. Where are you? It's like when the kids used to play hide and seek, right? I knew where they were. Where are they? Hmm, where could they be? He knew where they were, and he wanted them to come out from their shame and their guilt. It's okay. I'm your, I'm your dad. Come be with me. I miss communing with you. I miss walking with you. Don't let this hold you back from being in my presence. We sit here sometimes and just do all the pretty things and gloss over the real heart things that God wants to do, and that begins with confession. 
I'm sorry I messed up when I said that yesterday. I'm sorry I fall short in this area of my life. I'm sorry that I'm not yet where I'm supposed to be in here. And you know what he does? He not only forgives you, but he wants to speak other things to you. He wants to speak encouragement. It's okay. I got you. It's okay. I love you. You're going to get there. I'm with you. Next time, ask my Holy Spirit for self-control. Next time, do this. He gives you a plan and what you should do so that you don't mess up again. So confession is huge. It also keeps, um, confession keeps us from being in bondage to sin, being held back. The enemy uses um, our unconfessed sin to make us a captive, you know, like shackles all around us where we can't move forward. And so Jesus wants to unlock that and for us to be free. And that happens through confession. The third thing in your prayer life that you can do is go to God with petitions, concerns, requests. Con petitions for other people. I speak things over people. I was thinking about this today. It totally popped in my brain as I was praying for today. I remember being like 20 years old at our old church and I was in the nursery. Brian was working there. I didn't work there. I didn't uh, do anything yet. I, I don't even think I was the nursery director yet. And I was in the nursery. We went to bring him lunch and I had like probably four kids at that point. I was probably pregnant. I was pregnant my whole life. And um, <laughs> 10 years of my life I was pregnant. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I was always in that state. So I remember I was changing the baby in the, in the um, nursery. I was not at all the way I, who I am now. I was a mess. I was a hot mess most of the time, hormonally. So I was changing the baby, and this woman in our church came up to me, and it was just saying hello. She happened to be there. I always remember her name was Sylvia Carrington. I always remember it. And she came up to me, and she said, Pastor, she, I wasn't Pastor. She said, Cynthia, I want you to pray for me for this. And I said, well, sure, sure, I'll pray for you. Why do you want me to pray for you? She goes, because you're such a prayer warrior. I was not a prayer warrior. I said, okay. Well, I am now, 30 years later, I remember what she said to me. She didn't realize it, but the Holy Spirit spoke through her and prophetically spoke over me because I've always remembered that word and thought, I want to be true to that word. I want to be a prayer warrior. And that's what drove me some of the time. We can speak things over people. So when you're spending time with the Lord and your petitions for people, that, that sister or brother that irritates you, that friend, Start to speak over them the things you know God would want for them. Lord, help them to be kind. Help them to be generous, Lord. Help them to hold their tongue. Father God, I know who they're going to be. I would speak things over my kids that were not at all what they were. But I would speak it over them. And you know what? Some of it's come to pass. God hears our prayers. Your petitions and your concerns for other people are so important. And this is the time where we do that. It's also a time where God does heart surgery on us and he brings those things to the surface in our own life as we give petitions um, up into the Lord. We also can pray for ourselves and what we want for our life and how we see saints in our midst that have amazing prayer lives or speak prophetically or have the exude the love of Jesus. And you're like, Lord, I want that. I want that in my life. And he wants to give that to you. He's a generous God. He wants to give it out. Another way um, that the Lord meets us is in lamenting. Now, lamenting is an old school word that a lot of, I think, this generation doesn't understand or know, and I'm going to bring it to your attention because it's so important. Hannah from 1 Samuel, it's a great story of a woman who knew how to lament and she can be an example to us. So we're going to read that. In 1 Samuel, I'm going to go to verse 3 through 16. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came, for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Pen Peninnah and all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, 
Her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and she could not eat. Have you ever been in that much pain? I'm sure we all have. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't, don't I mean more than you to you than ten sons? Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will not only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him back to you, Lord, for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. She would raise him as a Nazarite. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep getting drunk? Get rid of that beer and wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant as a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And I didn't tell them to add this, but this was interesting. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. There's something powerful in lament. I had a season of probably two years of my life. I was thinking about it. Was it really two years? Probably two years of my life that I was in a season of lamenting, of pain and grief. None of you would have known that because it was in my hidden space. I call it my hidden years. And I actually found a book called The Hidden Years. And it has this great quote by Alicia Britt Cole that really just really exemplified exactly what I went through. From God's perspective, anonymous seasons are sacred spaces. Hidden years are the surprising birthplace of true spiritual greatness. In those two years of me crying out and lamenting before the Lord, he met me, he healed me, he spoke to me. He reminded me of David and how David would write the Psalms of lament but at the end of the Psalms, whenever he wrote a psalm, a psalm of lament from a painful thing he was going through, towards the end of the Psalm, he would say, but yet I will worship you. But yet you are God. But yet you are holy. David knew how to turn his lamenting into worship. It's important as we lament before the Lord and that we get honest before God, and that we are vulnerable with him about the things that aren't fair, about the things that are disappointments, about the painful things that all of us will go through in our life, and we pour out to God in our pain that at the end we understand, but yet, Lord, I will worship you. No matter if you give or take away, I'm going to walk with you. That we turn our lamenting into worship. We have to lament we have to grieve the painful things in our life or those emotions will become like cement in our soul. And that, that they will make you stuck. They will keep you stuck in your faith where you will not move forward. You have to be honest with God with your pain and your needs or else you will not move forward in your faith. I'm spending a lot, a lot of time on this point because I think that's where a lot of Christians are. I think that as I prepared this, I felt the Lord saying it might be where a lot of you are. We can get so stuck, and you're like, why isn't he speaking to me? Why don't I hear him? I, I just, I can't do anything from this spot. Because maybe you're not done processing your pain and your lamenting before the Lord and bringing him into it with you. We can complain a lot in this space. But are you asking the Holy Spirit to come in and reveal the things that he wants to do in you in this time so that he can heal you and bring you closer to him? 
There was a woman in the Bible that we see that Jesus points out three times. And every time in the text, you see Jesus defending her, praising her. He calls all of us to look at, our, to look at her and to model ourselves like her. This woman was Mary of Bethany. And in Luke 10, 38 through 42, which all of us have heard this probably portion of scripture, I'm going to show it to you a little bit different, um, of Mary and Martha. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus when he came into the house. I honestly don't even think Mary knew Martha was in a tizzy fit. I don't even think she paid attention to Martha. I don't even think she knows, knew what was going on. I think she was lost in Jesus. I think she was lost in his presence. That she knew who he was. She was at his feet and thought, I'm going to soak in everything he wants to say. That she knew his presence would change her and transform her. A prayer life and a desperation at the feet of Jesus is what we should all long for. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, this is the only space that will transform you, that will change you to look like Jesus. When you are on your face before the Lord and you cry out to him and you're reading what he's telling you to read and you're praying for the people that you want to pray, that is how you grow in your faith. That is how you're going to be eternally changed. I just want to encourage you with that. My sermon today is very simple. It's very simple because it's important that it's in the space with Jesus where you're transformed. I want you guys transformed. I want you to look different. I want to look different. But as your pastor, you know, we're in our discipleship class I can't tell you guys, this discipleship class is awesome. Isn't it awesome how God is speaking to us? And you're learning the spiritual, um, you know, dis disciplines, praying out loud, which is transforming people, reading God's word, memorizing verses, all the things we know to do. And we share about it every Sunday and all that. Well, today we started our testimonies. I'm encouraging them to write out their testimony, like they're sitting across having coffee with a friend, how did Jesus change my life? And this is how he's going to change your life. And then leading them to Jesus through it so that they know how to do that. A lot of us don't even know how to do that or don't even reflect on what Jesus did for us. Especially for those of us that maybe grew up in the church, it's hard for you to think, well, how did he transform us? I was kind of born into this. What a blessing that is. It's a real blessing. But I'm sitting there and I'm listening to these testimonies and how God is, has transformed people. I, I, I always say we should have a, a testimony Sunday because we just all were crying in the class listening to testimonies of how God has changed people, how people walked in this church by invitation and God met them and someone stepped out and prayed for them, didn't even know who they were, gave them a word from the Lord, and how they actually sat down and felt the hope and peace of God for the first time in their life. Same person having, you know, suicidal thoughts and um, were depressed, all of those things. And I thought it was so interesting when I was reading Mary and Martha for the word anxious to be there. Isn't that just a rampant word in this generation is in anxiety? Guess what? It was a thing back then, too. Anxiety, depression, all of those things. And Mary knew what to do. She sat at the feet of Jesus. So I just want to encourage you this week to maybe let the Holy Spirit transform your time with him. What does he want to speak to you? Maybe he wants to up your prayer life and petition for others. Maybe he wants to deal with some confession and, and heart surgery on you. Yeah. 
And to like, you know, David always said, examine my heart. Show me what I need to do. You know, he never let the day go by without saying, examine my heart. Come to the surface. Like, Lord, tell me. Tell me how it is. How are you going to grow if you don't get the truth? <laughs> you know? So I want, I want you to just ask the Lord for the truth so he can do some surgery on you. You know, or maybe there needs to be a season of lamenting, of grief. We're really good at continuing going in our life once pain has happened. And that's what had happened to me. It caught up with me. And this one thing that happened, I was like, that's it. I'm done. I love you, Jesus, but I'm not doing this pastor thing anymore. I'm disappointed in people. I'm in pain. I just, I can't do this. And I was honest with them. I mean, I, I have, I'm very verbal with my relationship with Jesus. I remember pulling out of here one time in a meeting when I had just like had it. And I remember pounding so hard on the car, like, I'm done. That's it. It's done, Jesus. I can't do this. I was, we're human. I don't care how spirit filled you are sometimes. We're human. We feel. We have pain. And so you have to express your pain to him or you will get stuck and the enemy gets in there and he puts bitterness and resentment and criticalness and judgmental attitudes in you because you haven't dealt with your pain. So I just want to encourage you, just go to work on yourself for the blessing of the people in your household. <laughs> Do the work on yourself because God will meet you. He will transform you and he will heal you. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can run to your presence with our pain, with our joy, with our life, Lord. Thank you, Father, that it's in the intimate space that we make with you, Lord, that you show up and you are there for us and you speak to us. You encourage us. You give us perseverance and endurance to run the race that you've carved out for us. Thank you, Lord, that you meet us right where we're at. We're all in different places and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you meet each person here today, right where they're at, that they can come to you. I just come against shame and guilt and confusion in the name of Jesus, and I pray, Lord, for clarity. I pray, Lord, for freedom in this place, that as they come before you in confession, Lord, that you transform them, that you change how we look, how we act, how we speak, that we start to become like Jesus more and more every day. So I pray, Lord, that you meet each person here right where they're at and you speak to them today. I pray as they talk this out and process this with our sisters and brothers around the table that your Holy Spirit will drop, your Holy Spirit will drop at that table and will speak through one another what you have for us to say. Help us to love and encourage each other well in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Enjoy your tabletop.